Hi, I'm Dr. Gabby Cora and welcome to my show, Dr. Gabby's Take, Make Life Interesting. Hi, welcome to Season 1, Episode 6, Life, Death, and Healthcare. 50 million Americans are uninsured these days, and it is very tough for us to make life or life-threatening decisions when we're not able to count on being insured to make those decisions. So this poses an additional difficulty, and this is why this is one of the most challenging episodes that we've done so far. Today we're going to be speaking with someone who faced a life-threatening decision and condition and had to make very tough choices as a person, as a family, within this healthcare arena. Now, whenever we have to make these life-threatening choices, you know, life or death, what do we do? The first thing that comes to mind is our individual choices. As an individual, we may have religious ideas that are ingrained in us about whether or not it's okay to let go or if we should really continue to fight. There are other decisions that are on an individual level that are also affecting our own decision-making process. For example, our physicians. Our physicians have, may have some preconceived ideas about life and death and about whether or not to seek uh, continued treatment. A third problem or a third challenge that we also have to think about is healthcare. You know, do we have that support and coverage to uh, help us, to aid us during a difficult process? So let's get back to the individual choices. Depending on our religious background, we may be more or less comfortable about making certain choices. Sometimes, depending on our or in this individual background, we may rely on our spouse to make those choices for us. This is where culture comes into play as well, where people uh, who are in these life-threatening conditions are not so free to make their own choices and they feel more comfortable whenever this choice is made through, you know, with the, their uh, couple and or through their family. Now the third and one of the most difficult challenges these days is healthcare. Uh, regarding coverage, some of us may have enough coverage to cover us, for example, in an acute situation, in a catastrophic life, life event, for example, if we have an accident. However, other times, if we have to deal with cancer and or chronic conditions, different coverage of pre-existing conditions, for example, may impact upon our ability to get treatment at all. My guest today is Anna Contigiani Gospodinov and her husband, Viktor Gospodinov. This couple faced one of the most challenging situations that any young couple with kids would face. She was diagnosed with advanced breast cancer and metastatic cancer at a time where she was hospitalized and she was just given 40 more days to live. What would you do? What would you choose? Watch the show and see what they chose. Here we are now with Anna Contigiani Gospodinov and with Viktor Gospodinov, her husband of how many years? Almost 17 years. Tell me a bit about your coming together, you know, mm -hmm. creating this family, living in Argentina, then moving to the States. Well, we met, uh, technically we met in Uruguay, actually. Uh, summer love, we didn't realize summer was over, so we kept going, and here we are. That was 21 years ago, almost 21 years that we met, and almost 17 that we got married. And three three kids later. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, um, the, uh, we waited. We actually dated for four years and then waited another four years before we started to have kids. So we did it the other way around as opposed to nowadays. We actually knew each other before we had the kids. You know? Exactly, <laughs> and before you got married and stayed together and everything. And how would you have described your, your marriage before 
this big event happened? Did you feel that you were having a great marriage, you were strong, communicating with one another? How was that for you? Well, till, I mean, before she got sick, I would, I would say this among men, okay? I would say basically two things. Uh, there's only one thing I regret about getting married with Anna, so I didn't do it a few months earlier. Okay, that was one. And the other thing I always say is I know I'll never win one of those multi-million dollar lottos because the one I did get was when she was placed in the path. So that's basically how I thought, of, that's what I felt about my marriage. Right? And, you, and you know that's and true. Yeah. I actually met Victor um, before you got sick, and I heard that from him. <laughs> so I've I've, 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 so you have, you have, I've stood by that. You have room. witnesses. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah they're, they're, they're paid witnesses. <laughs> <laughs> so. Anna, tell us your story. Where do I begin? But on 2008, November 2008, we went to a friend's house for Thanksgiving. And the morning after that, I felt really bad. I had a terrible headache. I would try Tylenol maybe or rest a bit. I wouldn't go away, so I tried Motrin and different medicines. And then I started throwing up. Mm -hmm. So when my husband saw me, I mean, I had three kids and no nausea, no vomiting, nothing. So this was very unusual for you. Yeah. I've never experienced so he this said, before. You know, this must, there must be something going on here because. Oh, he tried to pick me up, to take me to the nearest ER, and and he tried to pick me up. My legs couldn't hold me, so we had to call nine one one. How were you feeling other than the headache? Were you worried that something was going on? No, no, I just had a terrible. The headache took over. I wanted, yeah, you know. <laughs> It's like, what's going on? Stop. Stop this. Okay. And the 9-11 took us to um, the hospital which was close to, to our house, which is Kendall Region. Mm -hmm. And there, since it was Black Friday, I see. It was, no, they need some studies and checkups. And then they said, we would like to call the head neurosurgeon. Okay. And the guy came actually, I don't know, a couple hours after. And he said, okay. So I asked him, what do I have? Because they thought it was maybe something like meningitis or something like that. And maybe my husband remembers more of me. I was lying down, my husband on one side and the doctor. And he said, no, I would have to make, do more studies to see what exactly it is. But yes, we do have a mass. And when he said a mass, you know, you automatically think... You knew it was not good news. No. So, mm -hmm. I told him, oh, well, you do whatever you have to do. And you know what I have to do, tell me. Mm -hmm. Because I, I consider myself a very good mother, not to be a mom anymore. Mm -hmm. What they did was remove the tumor I had because my main tumor was in my right breast. I see. But it has it had metastasized. That means that it has spread to other parts of my body. So was the headache the first symptom you had? Yes. I had one tumor here, the back of my head, another tumor here. So one was occipital, and the other one was yeah. frontal? Then as I said front and my tumor was here, mm -hmm. but I also had spots in the left
left lung, left kidney, base of the spine. That was, I, that was three years ago. You know, this big thing strikes, you realize something's wrong, like, you're like, this, this is not my Anna, something's going on here. I mean, yeah. she got sick that day. Yeah, I mean, she had, never, you know, three pregnancies, never had morning sickness, and all of a sudden she was, by two in the afternoon, she had thrown up like seven times, and uh, when I, she just couldn't even stand. And so we were, we're off to the hospital, I went one and let the pros do it. And, and um, mm -hmm. You know, initially they, they have clinical symptoms. They say this looks like it's meningitis. They do a CAT scan. They tell them, you know, they say, hey, there's two masses in the brain. Uh, we'd like to call the chief neurosurgeon. This is Thanksgiving Friday, back Friday, 9:30 p.m. I come from a family of doctors. You don't call the chief of anything about hospital on that day if it's not very serious. So obviously it was worse than an ingrown toenail. And uh, the guy showed up about an hour and a half later, to his credit. And uh, looked at the same images and said, I don't know exactly what it is, but it looks very bad. I'm very worried about the mass that's in the occipital region. And um, basically, you know, at this point, Dr. Ford was like maybe one in the morning. He said, You're going to ICU. And then he looks at me, You're going home. She's going to get a, you know, an MRI first thing in the morning, and we'll take it from there. Uh, 72 hours later, she was getting. A, cr a craniotomy done to remove the tumor back here. Surgery went fine. She was in a medically induced coma for a few days. She pulled, she, she pulled the tube out of her own throat, which did cause some problems. And because of that, her, they weren't able to keep her blood pressure low for the amount of time they wanted to. Thus, she had a stroke. So that's when she had the stroke. Yeah, she had actually she had the stroke about 36 hours or maybe 48 after pulling the tube out. There was even you know, small investigation done, but the, the dosage of, of, um, of uh, sleeping drugs or whatever were, was adequate for her weight, and uh, so it was basically the will to live. Now, now, Anna was in and out of consciousness so for I, a while. So after the stroke, she was totally gone mentally. I mean, she was awake. How long? Four months. Okay. For four months, she was like an advanced state Alzheimer patient. And, and those are the months that you're like, I have no recollection I of these no months. Recollection. Do you remember anything at all? No. No. The only thing I remember is because... He told you. He told me. But now because you remember. Not because I remember. Yeah. Really. Now after, after what do you remember of those three or four months? How much tape do you have there? <laughs> I remember... What happened? What was happening? So you well, saw, I mean, you know, Anna's in and out, but, but you, you see she's more out than in. She was, so, here, where, um, after the stroke, that's when I was told, listen, you know, what she has is so aggressive. It's all over her body. You're not going to stop this or, 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 or cure this or whatever with conventional medication, non-conventional, whatever you do. It's, it's too advanced. It's too widespread. Uh, and on top of that, she wasn't responding mentally. I mean, she was awake and stuff, but she was asking me, you know, where where are the two sets of black twins that we have? And so that's how gone she was. Mentally. So you were like, okay. Yeah, I mean, some. I mean, that one sounds even funny, you know, two sets of black twins. But when, but a lot of the things that she would say were not exactly funny. And what kept you going through that time? So, so you knew that, you know, you, you had the conventional diagnosis of what was going on. At the same time, you saw that she was not responding. She was not conscious. What kept you going? Uh, I've, all my life, I've been an extreme, extreme positive thinker. Um, and I basically said, it's time to put your money where your mouth is. And, uh, but fundamentally, I was, um, I was almost... It was all about not doing what I had to do so my kids would not be left without a mom. Uh, with all the uh, pain in the world, I, would, I could accept the fact, you know, losing her. Uh, but I just couldn't stand, I just couldn't swallow the idea. It was like a watermelon going down sideways. Um, that our kids that were three, seven, and nine at the time would be left without a mom. And, um, you know, you, you go through sleepless nights, you go through many things. You, 
have all the peaks and valleys and, and everything, but the average was, you know, positive thinking. And obviously, there's, you go through the, oh, well, she's going to die, there's nothing, you know, you're crazy, what are you thinking? But then, you know, a few minutes later, you're like, okay, no, no, no we're, we're going we're gonna to keep on fighting. But the truth is, I never knew what the result was going to be. I, I knew I could have some influence on the process, not too much. And you uh, could be there as you were. Yeah, but the, the main motivating factor was to not let down my kids. Um, I, um, I thought, well, if she does pass away, uh, our kids will keep growing and, and maturing. And each one of them, at one point in their lives, would look me in the eyes and ask me, Dad, when Mom was sick, did you really do everything you could? And I promised myself I would do whatever I had to do to never feel embarrassed if that question was ever thrown on my plate. Has he lived up to that? <laughs> and, I mean, really, uh, I can be, I mean, I'm well aware that, uh, you know, a uh, relapse you know, can take for life in, you know, six months from now, or six years from now, or six decades from now, I don't know. But whatever it may be, um, I'm in peace with that, you know, that mean, cool guy we all have in our bathroom right above the sink? You wash your hands in the morning and brush your teeth. There's a really mean guy, a gal, <laughs> and uh, I can look myself in the mirror and, and get in peace that I've done what I believe is I could do. I mean, I really don't know if I could do anything else. So, Victor, at the time you you were working, and now all of a sudden she's in the hospital. You have three kids. You have a job. You have finances. You have bills to pay. What happened? I, I just stopped working. I, I mean, well, I didn't, I didn't work anymore, you know, uh, monetarily speaking. Uh, but I don't think I've ever worked harder in my life because it was, you know, anything from changing her diapers to learning how to give her shots. And, um, but I gave up everything. It, it, it's tied into what I just said before about, you know, my kids asking me, could, you know, did you do everything you could? We uh, learned to survive on solar energy. <laughs> uh, we had we had a lot of help and support from friends, family, um, people. We 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 had been volunteering for the American Cancer Society five years before she got sick. So we had a um, without knowing it, we did, we had developed our own support system uh, without knowing it. You know, all those people. Were there? They were there. I'm one of the founding members of the Rotary Club of Doral. And all the you know the people I met there, and they, they, they were just all the incredible support. Healthcare bills in this country can be atrocious. How did you deal with that? Well, what initially looked like a tragedy, because the company I had I, I was working at had closed about three months before. So at the time, my medical my health insurance was going from like three hundred eighty dollars a month to like two thousand. And I said. You know, I don't even know what's really going to be happening in the next month. I was involved in real estate and financial services, and um, I said I'm not going to I'm not going to pay you know, I think it was like close to twenty one hundred dollars a month. With I don't even have the other cash consistent cash flow coming in right now. Just let it be. And um, because of all this, actually, we should qualify for Medicaid, and uh, which was ended up being a blessing in disguise because Blue Cross and Blue Shield, I would have had to pay 20% of all this stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, her bills are like a million dollars, They're like up north of three. Uh, you know, she was hospitalized for, in total for about five months, four and a half months. Um, you know, she still gets her Hesept and her Rydia, you know, brain surgery back in July. Uh, you know, uh, there's, it's, you know, just the hyperbaric medicine alone, uh, just all the things she's been through, it's, it's hundreds of thousands of dollars. And, and then, so I really don't know. I mean, initially I thought, I was like, oh my God, you know, I'm without insurance, and it ended up being the biggest blessing in disguise. Because the year prior to her being sick had been bad for me financially, because real estate and everything has started to go downhill, yeah. Um, you were able to. Yeah, we didn't have it. We, didn't, we weren't showing savings. We weren't showing big income over yeah. the last six months, or, or. But today, if 
you know, a person is without a job, but does have some money left. Yeah. Let's say let's say he has a hundred thousand dollars in the bank, and you know, a day and a half in ICU, that's that's it. You're gone. A hundred thousand yeah. dollars is down the drain, yeah. and and they're put in a position in which, oh no, you don't qualify for Medicaid because you have uh, no, I don't have the hundred thousand anymore. Exactly. <laughs> you just I just gave it to you, the hospital. So that that part is pretty much that. Um, obviously, we were lucky. We were blessed. Um, you know, yeah. these things work themselves out some way in the most ridiculous or ways, whatever, you know, I, I really don't know how to describe it sometimes. Fast forward to now. Tell me what's happened in between, in between these years. <laughs> yes, a lot has happened and here you are with yeah, us. I've been, I was <laughs> declared in remission in 2009. Um, checkups and um, July was it mm -hmm. this year I had an operation a surgery in my, the side of my head mm -hmm. here because it was a little spot there, there was another spot no I had to open it they took out the tissue and part of the it was on the surface of the brain. So July of this year, what symptoms did you have? Or was it just a checkup that you were having that... It was a checkup. So uh, the checkup no spotted it and said, this is what happened. What did you think then? I thought, not again, please. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've been in through a lot. But you kept going? Yeah, because I, had the will. I still have the will to fight. So you were like, I'll have the surgery. Mm -hmm. When did you have the surgery? Yeah, this was in July. In July? This year. And well, the surgery went well. <laughs> and I have to thank my husband also because when I got sick in 2008, he stopped working to be beside me. Mm -hmm. Was and is my primary caregiver. So he's he's been a, a great support for you. Yeah. And you've been a fighter. He's been my hero, my knight in shining armor. Okay. But yeah, I'm a fighter. You're a fighter too. Because yeah. it, it's I'm, I'm sure there were times in which you were getting up in the morning and not feeling well at all. Yeah, but fortunately. Now, the chemotherapy and everything, I didn't have the bad side effects. Are you still on chemotherapy now? No. When was it? How long did you have remember. chemotherapy? So it was more like a few years back? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, nowadays, I still have my port, mm -hmm. but they, they just gave me non chemo infusions. Well, infusions on what? What kind of medication? One is Aradia, that's for the bones. I see. And the other one is called Herceptin, it's for the immune system. I see. So, but it's okay. Um, you, you've gotten used to it. Tell me about the blogs and about the radio. Well, blogs, the, the blog started off basically as a um, leave me alone tool, believe <laughs> it or yeah. not. I, uh, I kind of know a lot of people, I'm kind of social. And, um, a little. <laughs> and initially I couldn't handle the phone calls. The reality is, I'm sure you cover that with your leading under pressure, managing time. And, um, and I couldn't handle the phone calls. Each call asking me, well, what's going on with Anne? I can't believe it, I just heard with minimum half an hour. And you know, the day only has so many half hours. And I started what originally was a mailing list. So I'd say, you know, in your case, Gabby, listen, I appreciate the call, whatever. If I didn't have your email, I'd ask you for it. And, um, and I started doing one in the English version and the Spanish version, and the list just grew, 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 grew. And that actually created a lot of support for us, too, because people, people started resending these to others and others and others. 
And um, so we got all, form, all kinds of support. This now is a blog. Um, it's uh, in English, it's anahope.net. On the blog section, it's all, all the original emails I wrote back then are in there. And the stuff that's going on nowadays, it's in there. It's, it's called Anna Hope, um, basically because we try to stimulate hope in others. You know, we, we can't give anybody hope. We're pretty good at, you know, stimulating it a bit, uh, fertilizing it, uh, so to say. But the real, the will, like she says all the time, has to be there. It might be covered up, you know, it might be a bit murky, but it, it has to be there. Tell me a bit about what your day looks like. My day? Yes. You get up in the morning. Yeah. <laughs> you get going. Get up in the tell, me, tell me a bit to of make the, sure the kids get up ready in the morning. to go to school. Um, my husband prepares breakfast, coffee, mm -hmm. <laughs> and yeah. And after that, I have to sit at home. What do you do when I you're cannot, home? I cannot. I cannot drive. Um, because of, I had a stroke back when they removed my tumor here. I had a stroke and that's why I have difficulty with my motor skills. My I see. Motor skills. So, and I'm blind from this eye. So some of the, the, the problems, so the side effects from the, that you have from the tumor or the removal itself um, was yeah. connected with the stroke? Because the, the tumor, yes, the tumor damaged the optical nerve, so I can only see with one eye. Mm -hmm. So I mean, I cannot drive, and I stay home, you know. Every mom does laundry. <laughs> Sometimes I sit in front of the computer. Okay. Yeah, that I do. Because my family is in it. So I see them through Skype. -y. So you stay connected? Yeah. Okay. And I also try. Uh, we also, because my husband does, does to try to inspire hope. The people, many people tell us, please, can you talk to, or can you come see? Okay. And that's what we do. So what do you do? And we'll, you know, we'll talk to him later today, but tell me a bit about what you do. Someone calls you and it, is it that they've just had a, a, a sad diagnosis? What's the, the, the uh, common usu threat? Usually, the, they, because I have my site, they see, maybe they read, because, you know, friends, mm -hmm. send them to other friends, and there are people there I don't even know. Mm -hmm. So, usually, they call my husband. Mm -hmm. and He's your public relations specialist. Yeah. He, he knows everybody. <laughs> okay, okay. So you've spread the word of hope. Yes, I try to spread because I think that what happened back in 2008, I got better. In my case, I, I'm Catholic. I believe in God, but I think it's very important to have faith in whatever religion you practice. So faith but has. I'm sorry. Faith is very important. And another thing is the people around you, including the medical staff, the, the nurses, the doctors, everything, and the attitude. The person who's sick, the will to fight, you cannot force them. Mm -hmm. I've talked to them few people that don't want to fight. Even though they have, you know, kids, grandkids or whatever, they don't want to fight. They just give up. They want to go. Yeah. Three years after the diagnosis and after all, all this hard work that you've done and that you continue to do. Um, where are you heading? What's next? Mm -hmm. Where you're heading is 
Right before she got her brain surgery in December of 2008, I mean, they, they, had, they had shaved her head. She was literally going in, being, you know, carted into the, uh, the operating room. And um, we, that's where we, we promised each other was that we would uh, meet our grandchildren together in on this earth. You know? And uh, so, that's, that, well, that's actually, the book I'm writing is called Two Promises. And it's the promise I mentioned before about doing whatever I had to do for you know, so my kids ask me that question, and that's the other one. One has been fulfilled as far as I, I'm concerned, and we, we're working on the other one, and uh, we don't want our daughter to get married at 15. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, you know, looking at 25 north, north of 25. So you have some so, good time ahead. Yeah, 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 yeah. So we, uh, um, hopefully we'll, we'll make it. What helps you stay centered? So you, you mentioned the faith, you mentioned your attitude. What helps you stay centered and uh, and healthy beyond that? My kids. What about the kids? G getting into an argument with a kid, or no. you know, let, getting them ready for the morning. I want to be there going? for them. You want to be there for them and with them. With them and my husband, because I want to be there. Mm -hmm. He's going to tell you later promises that we made. So that strong desire is, is keeping I, you I think, going. Yeah. I think that's the main thing. And then, of course, God. I'm, I'm sure sometimes you get up in, in the morning and you're like, oh, I'm done. No, I'm frustrated. No. Okay. And that, that was my question. But you're I'm like, frustrated, I'm frustrated sometimes when I can't open something. Can do something that I usually did mm -hmm. before. What do you tell yourself mm -hmm. when you're frustrated? When I'm frustrated, yes. God is with me. God is with me. And then sometimes I come down and I can. And you can. It's like when when, when you're like in a in a more relaxed uh, state, it, it yeah. things go smoother. Yeah. It's a pleasure to be here, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, like I, like I always say, the best medical advice, because that's the one thing that bothers me. The one thing that really does bother me when the guy get asked about medical advice, you know, is this the right drug? Is this the right? I'm like, not the doctor. Always, my answer is basically the same one. My yeah. only medical advice to you is, find the doctor you feel the most comfortable with. Maybe a conventional, not conventional, uh, you know, voodoo, whatever you believe. <laughs> but no, mm -hmm. pretty conventional. <laughs> mm, don't give up. Yeah, and it's keep, all it's keep on fighting. Yeah, you, you, you doctors are very good at the diagnosis, but they're not that good at the prognosis. Right. We we don't have a, a crystal ball. Yeah, exactly. And, and I, I know you're a doctor. I come from a family of doctors too, yeah. so I don't mean in a, in a demeaning way at all. But the, we don't know, the, have a crystal they'll ball. They'll tell you, yes, sir, yeah. you have lung cancer. Now, I've met too many people that were told they had six months to live, and here they are, 10, 15, and 20 years later. We always say that as doctors, we don't have a crystal ball, but we do have the uh, the the obligation to help with hope. And and hope does not necessarily mean you know there's going to be this cure, or, but it's it's helping the person be well uh, at their core, no matter what, so that we can provide a helping hand and and, and again that inspiration to say we're here. Whatever you want to do, just let us know, and we'll help you on that way. And, and, yeah, transitional therapy. The, you know, there is a point, um, you know, when she was in her darkest hours, I mean, I was told I had no sense of reality, that I was dangerous for my family, quote unquote. And I was telling her, why? And I said, well, because you think she's not going to die. I said, no, I know she's going to die. I'm just fighting with the timing. And, you know, that, that's the truth of the matter. And it was, uh, and, and the whole, the whole way, um, not all, but some doctors are very, very, very negative. And, um, and they do a lot of damage with that. Even though they, they, obviously they're operating from a point where they're trying to be realistic. Yeah. But there's a bit of arrogance sometimes mixed up. 
Yeah. Again, we don't have a crystal ball. We can look at stats. We can look at what we know in, in terms of medicine. But unless we can create that connection with people, we're really missing a big part of, of the whole of the whole issue about diagnosing someone, treating the, the condition, and, and just being there to, for support. Yeah, but on top of that, we all respond different to, to the same things. I mean, yeah. me and you could be sitting in exactly the same place, yeah. and you're sweating, and say, oh, it's so hot out, and I'm, 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 yeah, I'm freezing. freezing, or vice versa. So it's same temperature, same yeah. room. Yeah, uh, we just respond differently. So, you know, give her chemotherapy, ex chemotherapy, and she'll respond in a certain way. I guess this person might respond a little bit better. This one might get the horrible side effects. Yeah. Don't give up. Don't give up. Fight back. Because miracles do happen. And I think that what happened to me was a miracle. Thanks for watching this show, and I know it was not easy to watch. We always have such a hard time uh, looking into cases in which we have to discuss life, death, treatments, and things that we tend to deny. So this is some of the lessons learned that I want to leave you with after watching this show. The first one is how can we look inside and look partly into this denial? Most young couples won't ever even look at what to do if something bad really happened to them, whether it's an accident and or a chronic condition and or if they were struck with cancer. So the first thing that I would suggest is see if there is a chance, an opportunity that you can at least discuss this once with your, um, with your, with your spouse. This will help you at least Try to figure out what you think about this and what your spouse thinks about this too. The second point to look at is discuss this with your doctor. Try to see what your doctor feels about some of these issues as well. And it's very important for you to be able to work through a doctor that you feel comfortable in terms of being aligned with what's important to you and what's important to your doctor too. So this is a very poignant point here where you may need to make some decisions of realizing who it is that you would want to work with if something uh, terrible or, or bad happened to you. Tough decision, but think about it. The second part is cultural issues. Oftentimes we may come from different uh, cultures and in general you have couples that get along pretty nicely together may have some common background in their cultures. That may be the case for you or it may not be the case for you, but you may want to look into these things ahead of the game. Where do we see some of these cultural differences? There are some cultures, for example, that would always take care of their parents. There are some other cultures that would think about bringing them to a nursing home right away. There are some couples that would always think about taking care of one another if anything happened. There are others in which they would obviously and, and very fast try to bring in a third person to try to help the, per, the person that's not doing so well. So think about these things. What's important to you? Think about quality of life for you. What does that mean for you? If you're not familiar with what power of attorney means, try to get more familiar with that and or a living will. So this will give you an idea of what you may want to do if something tough really happened to you and make a choice. The most important thing about this show today and all our conversations is to keep our hope up. Even with the greatest medicine that we have today, physicians like myself, even if we've been in practice for over 20 years, still don't have a crystal ball. So discuss whatever it is that you need or want to do with your spouse, with your family, with your doctor. Check out what kind of support you may have in healthcare but never lose hope because there's no one who can give you the hope from the outside. That hope comes from within. Thank you for joining me and hope to have helped you with some of these lessons learned to make life interesting.